Hey, this is David Plotz, CEO of CityCast. CityCast is hiring a director of finance. And because you're listening to this, I thought you might be a great candidate for the job, or you might know a great candidate for the job. CityCast is a national network of daily local podcasts and newsletters. And as our director of finance, you would develop our finance strategy and lead finance and accounting. CityCast is growing super fast, and we are changing local media in the U.S. And as our first finance director, you'd work directly with me to make CityCast an amazing and innovative and fiscally sound business. The job is remote. You could be anywhere in the U.S., and we're offering a competitive salary, great benefits, and a fantastic set of colleagues. Plus, we're part of a very stable parent company. So if you're interested, please apply. Go to citycast.fm slash jobs for more information. That's citycast.fm slash jobs. Today on CityCast Pittsburgh. If you were late every third day that you went or logged in to work, you'd probably get in trouble. Almost anyone would. But that's about how often the buses show up late for us here in Allegheny County. And look, I know it's complicated. And running this massive agency ferrying 125,000 passenger trips a day cannot be easy. But we're wondering what our leaders, and specifically the woman in charge of it all, would like to do to make it better. It's Wednesday, March 27th. I'm Megan Harris, and here's what Pittsburgh's talking about. Catherine Kellerman is the CEO of Pittsburgh Regional Transit. Thank you for having us in your office. Thank you for coming to visit. How would you say that? Pittsburgh Regional Transit is doing right now? How do you think people perceive you? Whoa, it depends on where you're, who you're asking. Um, I, well, let's start downstairs, yeah, the so folks that are waiting at the bus folks stop. Folks are waiting for the bus stop. I, when it works, it works fabulous. And when it doesn't work, it's going to drive you crazy. Uh, we're not special with that. That's any transportation system. Um, the vast majority of the service that we run is is out there as scheduled. It's out there on time. Uh, Now, we use an on-time window of a minute early to five minutes late, um, and we're not always the most timely. Uh, Before I got here, people said Pittsburgh was special, and I thought, whatever. And then I got here, I was like, oh, right, it's like a map that got crumpled up and left hilly. So there's a lot of places where if a road is stopped or somebody's parked or there's construction, that the cascading effect in our schedules is amplified. We just don't have other options to get from A to B. Yeah, I think in your latest service report, it was down to 67% yeah, 67% performance and, from 71% yep. the year yep. before. And of course, when you see that, you're like, well, God, if I was late one time out of three, I would get in trouble. And that's true. Uh, but let's look at the schedule. So like within, let's say it takes an hour for the bus to go from one end to the other. Yeah. If the operator is hitting, I. Uh, you know, let's, let's give it nine time points. That's easier. Hit six of them on time, but as late the other three, that route's going to be 65% t- on time. Mm-hmm. So they're still on time throughout it. It doesn't mean that one third of every route is gone. It means one third of the stops in there, you're not on time. If that's your stop, you don't care what I said. You don't care how we measure it. The bus was late. And then you probably ended up late somewhere else. Um, it's a very different calculus. Like if I'm driving yeah. and my car messes with me or someone else in traffic does, I blame that person. I blame my car. I blame myself for maybe not servicing my car. But the buses, you're blaming Catherine. But with yeah. the transit system, there's this large government entity that I can mm-hmm. point to and be like, how dare you? You bureaucrat, you. Absolutely. I think the other point is when we look at timeliness, for most of us, we look for when we when we begin and end a trip and are you on time? From a transit perspective, we've been, over the last 20 years, we've moved away from, do I want to be here when the time point says, or do I want to give you on-time arrival information? So your smartphone or text message can say, hey, I might have been scheduled 735, but I get here at 742. We're going to report that late in our service document. Mm -hmm. But usually what happens, and not special for PRT, but in transit in general, Folks will say, oh, okay, well, I don't care when it's supposed to be here. You're telling me it's going to be there at Yada. And do you walk out and the bus is actually there? Yeah, we've heard, we yeah. reached out to listeners and readers of the Hey Pittsburgh newsletter. And one of the mm-hmm. things that we heard the most about was ghost buses. Ghost buses. Ghost buses. It's a very dramatic name. It is, isn't it? But it does get your attention as it should. So ghost bus is that, that schedule is telling you the bus is going to be there. And yet it does not show up. 
Well, I mean, what is your goal then? Is it no ghost buses? Yeah, the goal to on out on of time service. Yeah, so out of service, our goal is less than one percent. Is that like a bus is like receiving maintenance? Maybe you're getting washed. Out of service means it was scheduled. The vehicle was scheduled and it did not run. So okay. should be in commission, but should it's not be in commission, but reason. it is not. And usually that is going to be from a manpower issue. Do you have enough people to do all of these jobs right now? We don't have enough people. Um, How do you recruit for all of these great jobs? Great question. Our issue really has not been the recruitment and hiring. It's been sort of a, it's been more of a training backlog. Now, because training takes a long time. Training and you have takes, to learn yeah. a lot of really like hard skills. I had a friend once that went through part of training. They mm-hmm. did not finish. And they were so anxious about backing up a bus right. and going across a bridge. Right. Like merging into traffic mm-hmm. across one of the bridges just scared the dickens out of them. Right. It is a challenging job. Obviously, the first job is customer service and safety, but you're doing that on a 30,000 pound vehicle driving with, you know, drivers and people are coarser than they were and they are ruder than they were. And that might be your folks getting on the bus. And so you are, you're driving, but you're also a tour guide and a crisis intervention specialist and a marriage counselor. Like there is a lot you ask from that job, right? Mm -hmm. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, the Pittsburgh region has um, the weakest job recovery post-pandemic. Um, just our, our workers are older. Folks who left work in 2020 and 21 in this market were a lot more likely to have access to a pension. So it's not they left and two years later they are definitely coming back because they can't survive. Folks might have retired earlier and so they have come out of the workforce. So our workforce recovery is not the same as it is in other cities, but, but that is... That, that's just what we have to deal with. Yeah. Um, we, but, and you've had a lot of retirements. We, When I started in 2018, something like 10% of our workforce had been hired in 1993. But you do have a big goal. Um, I saw in the Pittsburgh Union yep. Progress that you're yep. shooting for 250 by the end of this year. We are, uh, the, the the it's a stretch goal, but that's what we put it there. We can hire 300 people this year. The more you talk about it, the more you manifest it. Right, right, right. Manifest. Is yeah. that just for operators? That is just for operators. We, that is separate from um, our mechanic workforce, and that is separate from uh, non-bargaining jobs. So what's so. your sell? Give give the people ah, the, the hard sell. Oh, the hard sell. Well, so um, if you're looking for a job, which is super duper easy, and you get your weekends off and you get your evenings every single evening and holiday. This is not the place for you. If I think you might want to work on this I know, pitch. Right? <laughs> if you want to know that what you're doing every day has value past your paycheck. I mean, yeah, it's, I mean, I can't compete with the benefits of being a hedge fund manager. Like clearly I'm not, we're not giving out Cartier's or anything like that. Um, if what you want is a way to build not just your neighborhoods, you know, this sort of nebulous concept of community. If you want to know that what you're doing every day makes a difference to your neighbors and, you know, your your sister's kids that you like and even the kids you don't like or gets other folks to uh, their job training. Like the, you, if you want to make life happen, I don't know where else you can go. That you can walk in the door and within 10 weeks make life happen happen. And to add uh, gravy for that, we have uh, not just excellent benefits, tuition reimbursement, um, super flexible scheduling. You will not be made to work overtime. You can work as much overtime as you want, but you can say no. And again, you're building your city, which is pretty damn awesome. So that's going to be my pitch. Hey, Pittsburgh. I know a lot of yins have been protesting lately. And if you want to get more involved in social justice, but just don't know where to start, check out YWCA of Greater Pittsburgh's Racial Justice Challenge. It's the whole month of April, and you'll have the opportunity to complete one short racial justice activity every weekday, diving deeper into issues of race, power, privilege, and leadership. And there are different kinds of modules, so you'll get to explore ideas about 
bodily autonomy, financial empowerment, caregiving, gun violence, even access to transportation. Plus, you're invited to join in-person discussion groups every Friday all month long at YWCA Greater Pittsburgh in the Southside. Learn more and sign up at ywcapgh.org. I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about things you are excited about, um, things that are coming in 2024. Uh, you're hiring operators. We are. Uh, I And trainers, too, to help out with that, yeah. And I hear there's a bus line redesign coming. Um, could that also affect schedules? Oh, my like goodness, that? yes. I assume it, it sounds like it affects everything. Isn't that like a great name, though, bus line redesign? Okay, so our realistically, our bus network was great 60 years ago, and we have certainly changed. Um Improvements can be made. Well, I mean, yes, let's say that. So we have a bus network that still says everyone should come into downtown and transfer and go out. So I was at a meeting over lunch and I was talking to someone who said, oh yeah, I'm on the South side and I take my buses into downtown and then I transfer over to Oakland. And this person could save, you know, 25 minutes out of his day if we could go straight, but he's always done this. So in his concept of service, like everybody comes into downtown, but first, no, they don't. I second, really know they don't post COVID. Third, the worst traffic you're going to hit, if it's not in Oakland, it's still downtown. So if a vehicle doesn't need to be there, can we move it and save a lot of time and go somewhere else? Second, you know, there, there is a, in, in Senator Williams district, um, a, a hospital in Natrona that we can't get to. Like we just don't have the capacity to get service out there on those shifts. Lindsay Williams. Yes, yes. Um, and we can't get out there. I, and we need a bus from somewhere else to go there. Or we have uh, this um, a passenger who lives down in Upper St. Clair. His name's uh, Ramesh Bambwani. And he comes to the board once a year. And he wants a bus stop because he walks just under half a mile between the guardrail and the, the shoulder into a ditch. Mm-hmm. Walks out on his side of the road. And then he steps over the guardrail. So then he's on 18 inches between like, you know death and other death Mm -hmm. and he crosses a four lane road with no turn signal and then he crosses two lanes doing a slip lane to the left and then another lane to get to a bus stop and he says can you give me a closer bus stop well he, he wants a bus stop and what he needs is a bus close to him so he doesn't have to first it doesn't take him 45 minutes second no one should have to risk death to get to a bus it's just like we shouldn't even have to say that, right? So do we have the opportunity to get Mr. Bambwani his bus? Um, and we we do, but that means looking at where we have an awful lot of buses. So if you've got a bus in your neighborhood every four minutes, how do you balance out Mr. Bambwani has essentially no access? Somebody else says, well, yeah, the bus runs every four minutes, but there's a ghost bus or it's unreliable or the bus might be full with students from such and such a place. So... It's a good conversation to have, but we also anticipate folks will be in their fields because, you know, we've, we have 20% less service than we did 20 years ago. And that's, you know, it's tied to funding, but we have fewer people and less service in post pandemic and folks are right to be in the, well, I mean, feelings are always valid. I'm not going to say that they aren't, but. I mean, how much of that is like a chicken and an egg thing? Like if there are fewer routes and sometimes there are ghost buses or questions about reliability or perceptions of bad reliability then fewer people get on the bus. So to to the system, it looks like fewer people want the bus. I I would say we get that more from decision makers outside of transit because the reality in transit, if we run a bus till one in the morning, that trip between midnight and one is going to be really lightly used because it's the last trip of the day. Nobody's transferring. Nobody's getting off that bus to connect somewhere else. You're only going to see a small number because people are going home. Is so that you, a bad thing? No, that's perfect. That's what it's supposed to be doing. So you look at the trip before that. So if if we ever say, well, let's remove last trip. Well, those folks have to go somewhere. And can they get out of work on time? Can we get them there? So a, yeah, for like yeah. a second shifter that yep, gets yep, off yep. at 11. Right. Or same thing with like, uh, or somebody who gets off work at six in the morning might be catching a bus at 630. So if you had, if the first trip was pulling out at six something and it's really, really lightly used, why are not you making this person sleep in the break room under fluorescent lights, which isn't good for anybody. So we very rarely will tweak the first and the last. We might smooth out frequencies. Um, but then if you want to, like if a bus is less than every 10, 15, 10, 15 minutes, you have to think about it too much. So it becomes a, I, I used to be able just to walk to my T stop and now I have to do X, Y, Z and it's an inconvenience. Yeah. And so maybe I'm going to make other choices, but it, most significantly, you don't feel like we're thinking about you 
when you design a service like um I mean the examples you've given up yeah. to this point have been kind of around removal or reshuffling. Yeah. How do you imagine the redesign is going to work? Is it to keep what we have maybe in a different pattern or is it to potentially add routes? Because I feel like service cuts have been a thing that people have been talking about have. for a it's while. A, it, they have. And 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 put that on me. Um, well, first, part of, you know, it's, it, in 2020, when we we started making tweaks in November 2020, because yeah, we didn't have commuter routes, we didn't have this. Right. And we had always had a certain amount of trips out of service every day. We'd had it for so long that was that's just how we did business. Yeah, fewer so, people are coming downtown, but a, yeah, the yeah, population yeah. itself hasn't really shifted that no, much. No, it hasn't. And people now went, I mean, 24-hour service should be a thing. We should be able to run like 10 core routes. And it is in some cities. It is. So we should be able to run like these heavy-duty things or, you know, routes that run half hourly until like 6.30. Realistically, maybe 9 or 10 o'clock is a better cutoff point for that, right? So what we hear from bus line redesign in some places, it frees up the ability to, to move things around that we have, but it also tees us up because when we, so the goal with this, bring 300 people in this year, 100 of these folks will not finish training. Um, they might be like your friend who says, oh my gosh, it's anxiety inducing. Um, I, tongue in cheek, I'm thinking about uh, an operator candidate we had who had no sense of direction. Um, <laughs> and then also, these schedules can be really challenging if you have family commitments. So of these 300 folks that will walk in the door, 100 won't want to end up being operators for various reasons. So our targets 200 people get into the workforce this year. We'll probably lose 120 to attrition and to retirements. About a quarter of our workforce is able to retire at any time and a quarter does every year. So that's a 16th, whatever that comes out to. Our attrition-wide rate overall across the agency is like 3%, but you got 120 people bouncing, that's a problem. I would, of that 120, then we'll put another 40 just in schedules to stabilize them. So bye-bye ghost buses and out of service. And then the remaining 40 will go into adding service. So bus line redesign tees us up for what that that new foundation looks like. But then using a, a really great equity document, where do you go? We will not add back a route that used to be there because the city doesn't look like that anymore and folks are making different trips. But looking at our equity framework, where is the best way for us to grow on this new foundation? So not necessarily new stuff. Well, I mean, there'll, there'll be new things in there. Um, but what will be, I think our, our big challenge is working with, you know, communities that do and don't support us. You know, if you've got eight buses pulling out in front of your house, if you want better service, we, we probably need to move one. And can, can PRT be accountable and reliable enough that, you're, that you trust us to move that one and do something good with it? And that is our responsibility. Well, so do you think that state funding could help at all? You know, Governor Josh Shapiro proposed $39 million to Pittsburgh this year. It's not a lot. Philly got more. Um, but it's more than they've offered in a really long time, assuming, of course, that the budget passes. Yeah. So $39 million is about three weeks of operating today. So <laughs> I know I'm such a buzzkill. Um, but, you know, our library line, we need $300 million to fix it up. It's still safe. But it's a bit rustic, we'll just say that. Like when stations are made out of two by fours and people cross creeks with rocks to get over to your station, you could spend the money. Our rail cars are nearly 40 years old. They came out, we bought them uh, when Doves Cry or Borderline were number one songs. And that's not even relevant because many of the people listening have were not alive. They were, weren't were even... You can always talk about things in terms of the Mon Incline. That was here for all of us. I know, right? <laughs> 154 years. Mon Incline was built before the Chicago Fire, incidentally. Um, and that's relevant because the Chicago Fire completely changed building codes in America. So anyhow, I digress. Um, but our rail cars will be about $750 million. We uh, our, our heavy maintenance facility in Manchester... Um, is old and full of, it's. It, if we open it, we would risk exposure to asbestos and we're not going to do that. So if we want to keep up with um, electric or hydrogen, we need a new facility that we can go in and retrofit. So there, there are big needs. There are big, big needs. You Government know, work is hard. Uh, it is, you're not there for the pay. <laughs> um, before we go, is there any space maybe for the public to be involved in all that you were trying to oh accomplish God, this year? Oh my God, yes, please. So <laughs> rideprt.org uh, is the website. So it used to be portauthority.org, but like you can't type that if you're on a street corner. Let's forget it. Rideprt.org. Um, there are, uh, our public meetings are out there. You can check Twitter to see what's going on. Please come to meetings. Um, we don't own this service. We just run it. We need to hear from the communities that own it. 
Um, and maybe we can't do everything somebody wants, but that's the guiding principle. And it's, it has to meet that community's needs or, or why would we even do it? So please, um, folks can also drop emails to uh, various departments at PRT. I think we might even have CEO at Ride PRT. You might not hear from me, but you'll hear from somebody here. So let's go save the world. Catherine, thank you so much. Thank you for uh, letting me crash the party. That's all for today here on CityCast Pittsburgh. If you're liking the show, please tell someone, rate us, leave us a nice review. And of course, make sure you're subscribed to that Hey Pittsburgh newsletter. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more news from around the city. Talk to you soon. I've never had a job longer than five years at a time. I've only had one husband longer than five years. <laughs> Commitments. It's a it's Right, a thing. right. You know, I mean, but not you, baby. You're perfect. I love you. Thank you for uh, 15 wonderful years overall and almost 13 years of marriage. So when you <laughs> I listen think you to me. Yeah. I know. I hope so. I love you.